please. Rahil Raza. Uh, what title do you go by? I'm president of the Council for Muslims Facing Tomorrow. You're also a pioneer in the uh, Muslim reformist movement, is that right? I am a founding member of the Muslim reform movement, yes. Um, what's the, uh, the history of uh, Muslim reformism in North America? Well, there have been uh, at various times people who have come up and said that they were reformers and that uh, you know this is something that they wanted to do. But I don't think that there was ever a formally organized reform movement until about two years ago when Dr. Zudi Jasser decided to bring together 14 people from across North America, the UK and Europe and actually formalized the Muslim reform movement, by which uh, I mean that we all signed on to a contract, uh, we all signed on to the vision and mission, and we started a website. And uh, today there is a Facebook page of the Muslim reform movement which has thousands of followers. So um, it's uh, moving ahead, it's slow, but it's something that is much needed, and uh, we are making uh, changes. Tonight you received an award from the Simon Wiesenthal Center. Uh, how did this come about? Well, I had visited the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles when it first opened, and I met Rabbi Abraham Cooper. And we sort of connected because I'm also into interfaith dialogue, and he's very heavily into interfaith dialogue, so we used to meet and talk when he came in Toronto, and we've kept in touch over the years. And then about uh, six months ago, I had an email from him saying that they wanted to give me this award of valor, and I was most humbled and most touched and most delighted, and here I am today. So among Jews, and especially uh, liberal Jews, there has been a, a taboo against uh, speaking about jihad or uh, Islamic uh, supremacism. You work towards removing that taboo, is that right? It's not just among the Jewish community, it's everywhere. I mean, we are living in a world today where political correctness has killed the half that the radicals hadn't killed. It is really, really a very challenging issue. The regressive left doesn't want people like us to speak out, political correctness, cho totally chokes freedom of expression. So yes, people don't want to talk about the radical jihadist ideology. And in the eight years of the Obama administration, he could not even articulate the word radical jihadist ideology, but it does exist. And it's something that has to be challenged. Uh, you know, I'm so inspired by the words of Simon Wiesenthal, who said, you know, who, that when you see evil, you have to expose it and you have to find it and you have to destroy it. And this is what radical jihadist ideology is, it's evil. It doesn't matter where, whether it's coming from within uh, you know, my own Muslim communities, but if it's evil, it needs to be exposed. So the mandate of my organization, um, the Council for Muslims Facing Tomorrow, is the three E's, to expose the problem, educate the masses, and then to empower for change from within. And for that, there needs to be a lot of work, there needs to be honest dialogue. And I find that the Jewish community has a far better understanding of the uh, dangers of terrorism, because in Israel they live with it daily. And so my work with them and my conversation with them and my interaction with them is, is very inspiring. There's a lot of support there. How about uh, organizations that claim to represent Muslim America like uh, Council for American Islamic Relations and Muslim Public Affairs Com Commission? Well, they claim to be the spokesperson for all Muslims, but they're obviously not. Uh, they are spokespersons, I think, only for themselves, organizations like CARE that have been labeled a terrorist organization by none other than a Muslim country, the United Arab Emirates, is something that most Americans should be aware about. How much credibility do they have? They are not part of the solution, they are part of the problem. Because what they are doing is pandering to the victim ideology for Muslims. Uh, no matter what happens, they want Muslims to believe that they are the victims. We can't live with a victim ideology, this whole idea that anyone who critiques or questions anything that's happening in the Muslim world is an Islamophobe is ridiculous. And so I break down these barriers and say, no, this is wrong. And everyone should have the freedom to ask questions, to criticize, because this is what 
uh, freedom and democracy is all about. And unless we can have self-reflection and critique of some of the very negative practices within Islam, we will not move ahead, we will not prosper, we will not progress into the modern world. How strong is the, uh, the influence of these groups like uh, CARE, or do you have an equivalent in Canada? Well, we had. There used to be Care Canada, but they changed their name name to the North uh, to the to NCCM, uh, whatever that stands for. And they think that by changing their name, people will forget that they were part of uh, Care America. So yes, it's the same entity, and they're very much there, and they do hold influence over the Muslim communities because there has never been an alternate narrative. Now, through the Muslim Reform Movement, we hope to provide that alternate narrative the alternate to the cares of this world to say that yes you can be a very uh, good American citizen and you can still be a good Muslim you know the two don't have to go against each other you must teach loyalty to the land in which you live to your children uh, you know then only we can fight this evil together because the problem is not just a Muslim problem it's something that affects all of us so if it's happening in America it's an American problem it needs an American solution if it's happening in Canada it's a Canadian problem it needs a Canadian Canadian solution, which means that everyone needs to be involved from the government down to grassroots activists. And that's what I am, a grassroots activist. But it's my job to create awareness, to speak the truth, to talk about the problems within my own community, my own faith, and then find solutions for them. Is there a, a particular um, religious uh, dictum within Islam towards uh, the Jews and the Jewish state? Well, the Quran tells us that we must respect the people of the book, and the people of the book are Jews and Christians. They are the followers of Abraham. The Quran, which is the holy book of the Muslims, in fact, tells us the story about the Jews. But having said this, there are parts of the Quran that speak to violence, not necessarily against the Jews, but generally in times of warfare, which has been misconstrued, misquoted, misused by the extremists to just support support their own anti-Semitism and their own, uh, you know, subversive agendas. There is a great deal of anti-Semitism in the Muslim world, unfortunately, none of which stems from the core teachings of the Quran, but are more politicized in nature. And so it's, it's something else that we fight against. Is there a risk in uh, importing uh, Muslims from the Middle East who've been raised under these political uh, anti-Semitic uh, attitudes in bringing them into North America? Well, there have always been immigrants into North America from all sorts of countries, war-torn countries, countries that are traumatized. It depends on what their intention is and it depends on how they are educated. Not all of them are anti-Semitic or not all of them are against the country that they are living in, but some are. And there are, of course, always those who manipulate the system for their own agendas. So, you know, we know that on the backs of genuine refugees, there are people who clambered on board who were not refugees and, you know, who were extremists. So I think we just have to be very wise, we have to be cautious, we have to be clever. We can't uh, be naive about bringing in so many people without knowing what their uh, agendas, what their intentions are. In Washington we just had a visit from uh, Saudi Prince Mohammed bin Salman and uh, he's uh, uh, preaching a, a platform of reform. But on the other hand it was uh, uh, revealed that uh, the, uh, the Gulf Arabs are, are, are bragging that uh, Mohammed bin Salman has Jared Kushner wrapped around his finger. Um, when these, when the, the, uh, this new Saudi initiative, at least with the United States, how much should North Americans trust that Saudi, America, uh, Saudi Arabia is actually going to reform uh, their uh, extremism, Wahhabism, in North American mosques? Well, it's a very tricky and very challenging situation. And we know that Wahhabism that came directly from Saudi Arabia has been the reason for a major part of the rise of extremism, radicalization. They have funded it, they have supported it. So when we hear noises coming from that part of the Arab world about reform and about change, one wants to accept it. Uh, it's always positive when they bring about changes in the lives of women in their 
own country. But you know, I'm um, an eternal optimist. I want to, to uh, believe that they are going to bring about change. But the day they build a church and a syn synagogue in Saudi Arabia, and the day that they free Raif Badawi, the blogger who's been jailed for so, for so long, that is when I will start having credibility in their talks about bringing reform.